Family Theater presents Nancy Gates and Robert Rockwell. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents The Kitty Story Story, starring Nancy Gates and Robert Rockwell. <laughs> Family Theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we're to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family Theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. And now to our transcribed drama, The Kitty Story Story, starring Nancy Gates as Jack and Robert Rockwell as Doc. man's an abomination. His, his work should be burned, and, and he should be tarred, feathered, and run out of town on a rail. That's what I mean. Oh, now, wait a minute, Jack. Why not let the book reviewers take care of it? Why should this paper's top reporter worry herself about kitty books? Can't you see the harm in these kitty books? Harm? Children's stories are as old as the human race. Nobody else seems to mind them. Everybody out of step but you. Oh, Gus, look at these things. Sir William in the Dragon's Kingdom. The Magic Ring of King Wonder. Sir Jim to the rescue. These things are poison, Gus. Poison? I want to do a series on them. Series? Oh, no. Why not take a real news story? We've got a swell hatchet murder. Needs your touch. Bring out the human interest side. Just happened this morning. Why don't you take it? I'm serious about this. I'm going to do a series about the dangers of permitting children to read this kind of thing. You really are serious about it, aren't you? Tell me, what are you going to do when I tell you you're crazy as a tick? Quit. Quit? I can always go to work for the sun. Sit down, Jack. I don't want to sit down. Who's boss here, me or you? You. Well, sit down. Now, what have you got against the author of these books, this uh, Dr. King? I don't even know the man, but I'd fight him if he were my own father. It's unfair to write the way he does, Gus. Unfair? Well, look at me, Gus. My father read the same kind of stories to me when I was a child. The same kind of stories this Dr. King writes, and, well, just like every other kid, I believed them. I believed that someday my knight in shining armor would come riding to my doorstep to sweep me off my feet. Well, he never came, and you can see why. I'm not pretty, and... In fact, you could say I'm as homely as a mud fence. Oh, no. Nah. And there are a lot more just like me. That's why these kitty books aren't fair. Teach children the facts and they'll be prepared for whatever comes along. I can't change your mind? These things are psychologically and emotionally... All right, all right. Turn it off. Are you going to let me do it? Or do I go to work for the sun? Uh, I guess I can give you a free time shot in a Sunday magazine. Oh, gosh. But I won't have any personal opinions. It'll have to be complete with research, surveys, and... Wait a minute. I think I know how you can get all the first-hand information you'll need. Remember any of your shorthand? Well, yes, some. Good. Go get your hat. I'm going to do a little phoning, and then you're going to play secret agent for about five days. What do you mean, secret agent? When I speak, jump, woman. Get your hat. And he says I'm crazy. Hurry up. You're not working for a month late. Oh, Gus, you old double-crosser, you. Uh, hello. Mrs. Bevins? Is the doc around? Uh, put him on. Now, where am I going to do all this undercover work? Uh, Dr. King? Uh, doctor, this is Gusta Bingman, managing editor of the banner. Oh, fine, fine. Uh, say, uh, I wonder if you could do the banner a favor. We've got a little girl over here with the makings of a good reporter, and we thought maybe you wouldn't mind putting her on your payroll for a week till something opens up here. That is, if it would be at all possible. Dr. King? Yeah. Uh, well, 
Yes, her father and I were old friends. One of those things, you know. Oh, splendid. Uh, would you wait just a minute, Doctor? Go ahead, Jack. You've got a job. And like it or not, you're going to get a story that'll put your Dr. King right out of business. Get out of here! This will be the greatest thing since the Brooklyn Grand Jury. Ha! Hey, Doc, you still there? Oh, no. Uh, no, of course I'm not mad at you. She was listening. I had to pretend I didn't know you. I'd um, better tell you something about this girl. <laughs> <laughs> Going up. Going up, please. Do you know which floor Dr. King's on? Oh, 25, ma'am. Penthouse. Are uh, you his new secretary? Yes, I am. Oh. Well, it's only for a week, though, isn't it? That's right. News travels fast in this building. Yes, ma'am. Look out for the plumber! <laughs> Oh, by Jim, will you look at that? Tools all over the floor. Oh, I'm so sorry. That was stupid of me. Yeah, uh, that's all right, lady. Well, may I help you? Well, I'll help him, ma'am. Dr. King's office is just around the corner and then down the corridor. I'm really very sorry. Uh, forget it, lady. It's all right. Let's see, this must be the door. Yes, Dr. King. Now, have I got everything... Portable purse, glove. I wonder what I did with my gloves. I must have dropped them at the elevator. I'll have to go see. Clumsy female. Why didn't she look where she was going? Oh, I bet you wouldn't be griping if she was a looker. Eh, she ain't a looker. Hey, get those fittings there by the door. Oh, yeah. The girl he hired at vacation time last year was really something to see. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, but this year, not so hot. Will you hand me my gloves, please? I'll get it, Mrs. Bevins. Miss James? And you're Dr. King? Yeah, won't you come in? I hope you weren't expecting a... Beautiful princess. Now, do I look like the kind of man who'd have beautiful princesses for secretaries? Oh, step into the living room. I'd like you to meet my housekeeper. Uh, Mrs. Bevins. What's the matter now? Nothing. Come on in. I want you to meet your new roommate. Roommate? Well, you'll be living here. How do you do? How do you do? Well, that takes care of the formalities. Well, Dr. King, I don't think I should... I mean, I do have a home of my own. Uh, Miss James, I keep rather difficult hours. If you're going to work the same hours I do, I think it would be best for you to live right here. Now, there's an extra bed in Mrs. Bevan's room, and it'll only be for a week. Unless, of course, you want to stay for the full two weeks. I sent my regular girl on vacation this morning. Come along, Miss James. I'll show you where you sleep. Now, just give Mrs. Bevan's a list of the things you'll need, and we'll have somebody run over for them. Oh, nonsense. I, I can go over myself. There's no reason for anyone to go to any trouble for me. Oh, it might be wise if you took a nap for a couple of hours. We'll be going to work at five. A nap? Well, it's just as I said, Miss James. We keep strange hours around here. I tell you, the man's insane. Well, he's keeping me up all night typing his silly stories. For two days now, from five in the evening until four in the morning. Well, I haven't had time yet, but don't worry. It'll be a great story. Oh, oh his story. Oh, the usual thing, I suppose. Knight in shining armor in the process of saving a beautiful princess. Oh, no, no, he says he can't save her for at least two more chapters. Not from dragons this time. In this story, it's an ogre. <laughs> and you know what he named the ogre? His name is Gus. Uh, Miss James. Oh, Gus, I I've got to run. I I'll try and call you later. Coming, Dr. King. Oh, you can lay off that doctor business if you want. Yes, sir. 
Uh, would you get your shorthand book? Oh, say, your friends don't call you Miss James, do they? No, most of them call me Jack. Jack? Jack. What a masculine name for such a feminine girl. Why, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you got your book? Mm-hmm. Uh, a letter to John Baudet, Rockaway House and Company, 10,000 Rockefeller Plaza, New York City, New York. Dear John, regarding your suggested revisions of The Bravest Night, I feel I must remind you our contract clearly states that I will not be obliged to kill or maim any of the characters in any of the stories I submit to your company for publication. I have no intention. Uh, well, what's the matter? Uh, am I going too fast for you? Hmm? Oh, oh no. Uh, no, it was what you said. You mean you never write about death in any of your stories? Well, no. No, I don't. When there are so many other possible solutions, well, the stuff's for children, you know. But what about dragons and, and witches and ogres, things like that? Oh, maybe I'll bump off an incorrigible dragon once in a while if there's no chance of reforming him. But I think for the most part it's better to keep everything on the sweetness and light side for the kiddies. Why not write about things as they really are? Why always the happy ending when, when real life isn't like that at all? I don't hey, see you... Hey, hold on, hold on. What forms a child's imagination? Well, the games he plays and... And the stories he reads or are read to him? Yes. Well, then why in heaven's name should I write about things as they really are? Isn't it wiser to write about them as they ought to be? If it's true that my stories help form the minds of tomorrow's citizens, then I'm morally obligated to see that my books are constructive, not destructive. Write happy endings as the normal conclusion to every story, and soon the younger generation will come to expect it. Now, which is the better? A generation expecting the best, or a generation expecting the worst? I hadn't thought of that point before. After all, I, I may not be so much to look at, but I'll find some nearsighted woman someday and maybe raise some children of my own. When that happens, I want the best kind of a world for them to grow up in. Uh, now, where was I? Hmm? Oh, pardon me? In the letter. Oh, yes. I will not be obliged to maim or kill any of the characters in any of the stories I submit to your company for publication. I have no intention of changing... Good morning, Mrs. Bevins. Morning, Jack. Suppose I should say good afternoon. Oh, I can't get used to these hours. Where's Dr. King? He's having his hair cut. I didn't have to remind him this time. Strange. <laughs> uh, you can have either cold or hot cereal. What'll it be? Hot cereal's ready. Hot, then. Mrs. Bevins, why did he pick a pen name like Dr. King? Here's your fruit juice. Thank you. Oh, I suppose it's because he's a doctor. Can't think of a better reason. A real doctor? No, yeah, was a pretty good surgeon, but he gave it up in favor of staying sane. I don't understand. He worries so much about his patients. Put him on the edge of a nervous breakdown and kept him there, so he started writing for a living. From the looks of things, he's done pretty well. You're not drinking your juice. Oh. How, how could such a young man do so many things? Well, my guess would be Doc didn't have to take too much time away from the studies for dating while he was going to school. Of course, I... I think he's pleasant looking, but he's not what you'd call ladies' choice. Oh, I think he's very good looking. Good looking? <laughs> Funny. Doc said the same thing about you not an hour ago. Must be love. Love? Nonsense. This orange juice is very good. Considering it's grapefruit, it's quite a compliment. Mrs. Bevins, did he really say he thought I was pretty? He did. <laughs> it couldn't be love. He's only known me for three days. Doesn't mean a thing. In Doc's stories, they sometimes fall in love in less than a paragraph. And so Sir Harry and the princess were married and they lived happily ever after. 
Well, so much for that. <sighs> I'm a little sorry it's finished. Finished? Tomorrow we start on the revisions. It's just about half finished. Mm, look, it's sunrise. Oh, it's beautiful, isn't it? Magnificent. That's one thing nice about working nights. You see so many beautiful sunrises. <laughs> it's a pretty good way of ending a working day. Doc. Hmm? The other night, you said you'd get married someday and, and raise some children of your own, and you sounded so sure of it. I am sure of it. Will she be a beautiful princess, Doc? She will be to me. Whether she is to anybody else or not doesn't much matter, does it? I guess not. If she is a beautiful princess, won't she expect you to be on a white charger? <laughs> if she's the right beautiful princess, maybe. <sighs> We're both pretty tired. Maybe we'd better turn in. I can almost hear Mrs. Bevins from here, snoring like a Trojan. Uh, how does a Trojan snore? Like one of your dragons, with adenoids. Mrs. Bevins. Mrs. Bevins, turn over. I'm probably too tired to sleep. Much, much too tired. Oh, Jacqueline! 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 Boy, now we'll get her. There'll be no stopping us now. Will we fool her? She'll fall like a rock. Oh, uh, Jacqueline! Is that you, Gus? Oh, yes, yes, what is it? Come on, my girl. Step through this door. She's coming, Chief. A few steps more. She's here. All right, boys, slam the gate. We've got her. Now we'll seal her fate. You're not Gus. You're an ogre. It isn't the principal, ma'am. It's the money. The ransom we'll ask you so big it ain't funny. And you? I'm the plumber who treated you mean. She's the ugliest, beautiful princess I've seen. I think perhaps we'd best let her go. To have her around huh, ain't worth the dough. Oh, yes, yes. Please let me go. If it's money you want, I'll give you lots of money. <laughs> it's more than money this girl will bring. Uh -huh, you mean... Why not? The king! It's a trap, that's what it is. You're trying to trap King Doc. The idea came from your own head. You wanted him... Career-wise, dead. No, no, I changed my mind. You can't do it. I won't let you. You hear that, Chief? She says you can't. You'd think her boss to hear her rant. As Chief Ogre in this ivory tower, it's certainly well within my power to try, convict, and seal his fate for crimes against the Fourth Estate. To only write what ought to be. A most abhorrent thought to me. You can't do it. He's innocent. Please listen to me. He's committed a crime. He must be published. Hold there. Inside the tower. That's him. By Jim, he sure came fast. <laughs> We've got the king at last. You there, inside the tower. Release my beautiful princess or I'll come in there and intimidate you. This second-rate amanuensis King Doc thinks a beauty as princess. We've only got an ugly one. Oh, by Jim, this will be fun. But stay away, Doc. It's a trap. Trap or not, I'm going to rescue you. It's a trap. Stay away. Wake Stay up. away. Wake up. Jack, wake up. Uh, anything wrong in there? Doctor, come in. Hurry. Oh, Doc. Doc, you're all right. You're all right. Oh, she was having a nightmare. I couldn't wake her up. I, I was so afraid you oh, would. Now, relax, honey. Everything's all right. It was only a dream. Uh, Mrs. Bevins, would you open the blinds or turn on the lights? Oh, I tell you, it sure gave me a start. I, I don't know what's wrong with me. I, I don't do things like this. I, I never have nightmares. I guess I've been working you too hard. I, I'll tell you what we'll do. Today we'll take some time off. Take in a show and eat out. Really have ourselves a time, hmm? It'll be good for me, too. Would you like that? Well, I'll go fix some breakfast. <laughs> I couldn't go back to sleep now. How about it? I'd like that very much, Doc. Fine. And, Doc, I'm sorry to be such a baby. Oh, forget it. 
Come on now, get into your Sunday best. You and I are going out on the town. I don't think I've ever had such a wonderful, no, no magnificent time. Uh, I'll bet you have. No, I haven't. In high school? <laughs> Not then either. High school seems a million years ago. A million? Couldn't be. How old are you? 25? 26? 30. Ancient. How about you? 35. You know something? What? I've never had such a wonderful... No magnificent time either. I uh, guess you'll be going to work for the newspaper in a day or so, hmm? I suppose so. Oh, we turn in here. Uh, suppose you could get Gus to wait another week? Gus? You know Gus? Oh, well, I... I, I had quite a chat with him the other morning, you know. Oh, of course. Well, I guess I could ask him if... if you really need me for the second week. Oh, I, I do, I do. Going up. Up, please. I, I don't know why. I don't like this boy. Neither do I. Going up, Dr. King? Twenty-five floors. It's too much to walk. Uh, yes, we're going up. Good morning, Mrs. Bevins. Morning. Have a nice time last night? Mm, had a grand time. A magnificent time. Here's your juice. You'll be wanting hot cereal, won't you? Yes, please. Must have stayed out pretty late. I didn't hear you come in. We did. We danced till dawn, and then we walked home. Walked home? From downtown? It was such a lovely morning. Well, you poor child. You've hardly had any sleep at all. I have to go down to the office and see Gus. See if he'll let me stay another week. Oh, that's splendid. Ready for your coffee? Mm hmm please. You'll be sure and give Gus my best, won't you? What did you say, Mrs. Bevins? Oh, I said the wrong thing, didn't I? No. No, you said the right thing. You know Gus, don't you? And so does Doc. You've both known from the beginning why I came here. Oh, child, don't... I, I've been such a fool. Such a fool. Wait, let me explain. Well, Jack, my girl, what are you doing back here? You double-crosser. I hate you. I hate you. You hate me? You hate me? Where are you going? To get my things. I resign. Resign? What are you talking about? You can just get yourself a new girl, you, you ogre. Ogre? Where, where is she? Dark. She went in her office to get her stuff. Well, what happened? Somebody blab? Uh, Mrs. Bevins. Gus, you. Well, you've had your fun, Dr. King. Why don't you just go home and leave me alone? Now, Jack. You keep out of this. Uh, honey, I don't want to go home. I, I want to... Well, you don't have to worry about my writing my anti-kitty story story. Oh, I don't give a hang about your story story. I suppose you know about that. You seem to know about everything else. No, it's not that, Jack. Will you listen to me for a minute? I'm Please. Not, I'm... I'm not interested in anything you have to say, Dr. King. Be fair, Jack. Oh, now, please. Well, just one minute. Jack, what I want to say is that... Well, uh, uh, that is... Jack, you're the... You're, with, without your life, just... Well, that is to say... He means I, to say... Uh, uh, he thinks you're the most beautiful girl uh, he's ever seen, and he loves you with all his heart and soul. Without you, life wouldn't be worth living, so will you please become his blushing bride as soon as possible? Uh, that's what you meant, wasn't it, Doc? Will you, Jack? Add a boy. Oh, Doc. You big... Could I ever love anybody else? Oh, Doc, I'm so... So... What she's trying to say is she could never love anybody else after knowing you, Doc. And you should have been able to see it sooner. And in finale, she says, yes, she'd be tickled to death to become your blushing bride. Isn't that so, Jack? Oh, yes, yes. 
Well, at least I won't have to do their kissing for them. And they'll be married and settle down in some nice little vine-covered castle. And everybody will live happily ever after. With the possible exception of the ogre who, from the look of things, is about to lose his best reporter. And now, here again, is Robert Rockwell. Thank you, Tony Lafrano. You know, the great watchword of today is security. Now, there may be wide areas of disagreement as to what forms this security should take, but it's a natural craving of the human heart. And to meet this, we have public security measures from national defense to unemployment insurance, and private security measures like life insurance and bank accounts and group hospitalization plans. Uh, of course, the average man is not so concerned for security for himself as for his family. He wants to protect those he loves. As head of the family, he understands that he's got a duty to see to the welfare of that family. Uh, but does this welfare and security mean physical and economic security alone, as if man lived by bread alone, which we've been assured on pretty good authority that he doesn't? Or, to be complete, shouldn't it include some small measure of spiritual and moral security? Say, the investment of ten minutes a day, which is just about the time it takes for family prayer. Now, that, of course, won't do it all, but it's a terrific step forward, not only for that kind of security, but for drawing down the blessings of peace in the home and of family happiness. That is family theater's message and only purpose, to give us all this secret security, even in adversity. The family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you transcribed The Kitty Story Story, starring Nancy Gates and Robert Rockwell. Others in our cast were Herb Butterfield, Irene Tedrow, Leo Curley, and Martin Dean. The script was written and directed for Family Theater by Robert Hugh O'Sullivan, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program by the mutual network which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lafrano expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home, and inviting you to be with us next week when family theater will present The Roll Call of the Reef, starring Arthur Shields. Mary Livingston will be your hostess. Join us, won't you? Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network. This is Mutual, the radio network for all America. <laughs>